Our scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. If you'll turn with me to John, chapter 10, we continue to study Jesus as our shepherd. And this morning we're going to look at verses 7 through 10 concerning Jesus being the door and what that means for each of us as well as for the non-believer. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. Shall we pray before we begin? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for the blessings you've already bestowed upon us this morning in our time of worship. And I pray that our hearts have exalted your holy and majestic name and our worship continues to be acceptable to you. As we come to study your word, Father, I pray that you will keep the evil one from us. You will enable us to focus on your word as you would instruct us from your Holy Spirit, giving us understanding of this particular passage and what it means to each of us. I pray, Father, for your children to be spiritually strengthened and encouraged in their walk with you. And I pray for those here today who do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, that you would work effectually in their hearts, showing them their sin, your judgment upon that sin, and if having Christ as their Savior, confessing their sin and believing in Christ and asking for forgiveness, they will be forgiven and experience your forgiveness and your love and your mercy. And so, Father, you know our hearts and you know our needs. And I ask that every need will be met according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us stand as we read from the Gospel of John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. In this passage, Jesus continues to address the Pharisees. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I... I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life, and have it more abundantly. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Dr. William Hendrickson in his commentary on the Gospel of John asked the question. Jesus said, I, I am the door. Is it the door to the sheep or is it the door for the sheep? And think about that. When Jesus is saying that he is the door, is he the door to the sheep or is he the door for the sheep? The answer is yes. I knew I love to answer questions like that. But let's look at this passage and we will see where he is the door to the sheep and he is the door for the sheep and what those two mean. So first of all, let's look at uh, verse 7. Jesus begins by saying, I, I am the door. This is an emphatic phrase there in the original language. We would translate that, I, I am the only door. And Jesus is the only door for eternal life. <clears throat> and that's what he's talking about here because he continues to talk about thieves and robbers. And he compares himself to them. They just come to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So you see the contrast there. Then he goes on in verse 8. Then verse 8 tells us this is the sheep, the door to the sheep. Look what he says. All those who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. So those who came before him, this was the religious leaders of the day. This refers to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. 
And they had their own system of authority and uh, they uh, had uh, additional laws to the law of God. And you had to obey their laws plus the law of God in order to be considered saved and have eternal life. And that's a work salvation. And nobody's saved by any work salvation. And so Jesus says that they're, they're not the right door. But he says here in verse 8... Uh, look at verse 8 very carefully. The sheep did not listen to them. The sheep did not listen to them. The verb to listen there means to hear with the idea of understanding and obeying. So the sheep didn't go to them at all. And so the sheep there, <clears throat> the sheep, the door is to them. Jesus said... In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. There's no way of salvation other than Jesus Christ. Your baptism, your church membership, your being good people, anything that you and I can list that we have done in order to work our way into heaven, it's not going to work. It's all by God's grace and faith in Christ alone. That's why Jesus says, I am the door. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus saw the, the uh, multitudes and he said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus uses the term sheep to describe the non-believers. They were, like, they were wandering like sheep without a shepherd. And, and that's what the non-believer is. They have a desire to love and to be loved. And they carry this burden within their own souls, deep in their own souls, that they have no peace and they're not real sure what's going to happen to them at death. And yet they desire to have this burden lifted, but they do not know where to turn and they turn to everything and everyone but Christ. And the only one to turn to is Christ. And he is the door to the sheep, to those lost sheep that need Christ. Now, let's go to verse 9. Once again, Jesus states, I, I am the door. Notice what he says next. If anyone enters by me... He will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. Notice the, the definite statement, he will be saved. He doesn't say he might be, he may be. No, he will be saved. Now, turn back with me, please, to chapter 6 of John. John chapter 6. And let's look at verse 37. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Look at that promise. Anyone who comes to Christ to be freed from the bondage of sin and death. To be removed from the judgment of God. Any man or woman who comes to him in true faith in Christ, you will not be turned away. You will be received by Christ. And you will never be kicked out of his family. What a promise that we have. That we have eternal life. Our eternal security is not in obeying God from the time we become a believer to the time we die. It's not our ability to have that assurance. The assurance that we have eternal life is in Christ alone as well. And the ones who have Christ as Savior, you know, we sin every day. Right? Yeah, listen, that silence is so convicting. You get in your car and drive a block. You've sinned. 
So our assurance of salvation is not based on our obedience. It's based on the same grace and love that saves us. But we want to obey because the love of God is in our hearts. And we want to obey to honor our Heavenly Father. So he will be saved. Now look at the next part of Jesus being the door. He will go in and out and find pasture. <clears throat> he has the freedom. The believer in Jesus Christ has the freedom to move about and find pasture. What is the significance of finding pasture? Notice he didn't say water. He didn't say milk. He said pasture. Well, everybody knows what a pasture is. It's where it's grass. It's where the sheep can eat and to be spiritually nourished. So when one becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, the good shepherd takes the sheep to pasture where the sheep can eat and grow. And so we apply that to us spiritually. You and I, having Jesus Christ as our Savior, have a spiritual life that needs to be nurtured. Where do we go to get that? Well, notice that it's the responsibility here in verse 9. He will go in and out and find pasture. The verb to find there, and you put it in this context, means to investigate and find spiritual nourishment. To investigate, to find. Y'all ever misplace something at your house? I can tell you where it is. It's in that closet in the depths of the darkness back in there. But think about this. It is our responsibility as believers in Christ to find the spiritual nourishment. That's why we all need to be in worship like we are here this morning. I want y'all to stop going to church if you don't mind. Would y'all stop going to church and go to worship the true and living God? Because when you go with the attitude of I want to go worship the Lord, it will change your whole attitude about worship. It's not going to church. It's not going to a building. It's going to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ to honor him. And so we come to church to find that spiritual nourishment. And the source of that nourishment is the pasture, not the pastor, the pasture. And that should be sitting in your laps. It's the Word of God. It's feasting on the Word of God that nurtures, nurtures us in a spiritual way. So we find, we investigate, we listen carefully. We know the scripture so we know whether the pastor is teaching truth or not. It's very important to know that. Notice also this pasture, this spiritual nourishment. Now let's turn to John chapter 17. John, John 17 has in it the high priestly prayer of Christ as he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to his arrest and trial and crucifixion. And in John 17 and verses 16 and 17, Jesus is praying to the Father. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. First thing Jesus says is we're not of the world. We, we don't fit in this world. We're spiritually alive. We're spiritually vibrant. We, we're holy. We've been set aside, dedicated to God. And we don't fit in with a world that is in spiritual darkness. And then he says, sanctify them by your truth. Sanctify. They've been set aside in Christ. Now the word sanctify means to be set, af set aside. And it also... Uh, along with that connotation means the process by which a believer is conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Everybody knows Romans 8.29, right? 8.28. What is Romans 8.29? That we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. So God has predestined, has predetermined before the foundation of the world that we would be conformed to Jesus Christ. 
And that process of being conformed to Christ is called sanctification. Whereas you and I study the Word of God and it changes our hearts, it changes our minds, our way of thinking, our way of living. It changes our values and our ethics. That's conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. And how is it done? By the Word of Truth. By the Scripture. That's how it's accomplished. As you and I read the scripture, we study the scripture, we memorize the scripture, and we apply it to life situations. You know, these people who study the scripture, so they have a lot of knowledge, but they don't live it. Attend all of these seminars and conferences and have all these books that they've studied, but their lives don't change. The believer that changes, the believer that has the word of God in them that's living and changing us. That's what it's all about. Is your study of the word of God, as you go through that door of Christ and in and out, are you different today than you were last year at this time? Because the word of God with the Holy Spirit working in you personally has changed you? You have an attitude adjustment? You think differently? You have different desires? It's an ongoing process. That's going in and out that door. And the shepherd leading us to where the pasture is rich. Where we can study the word of God. And the spirit of God takes that word and changes us. Now, let's look at verse, let's go to uh, uh, this John 17, and let's look particularly at verse 16 in there. They are not of this world, as just as I am not of this world. So they're not a part of it. We're different. We're totally different. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. So we're different. What does this difference mean to you and me? In Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, in verses 23 through 28, Jesus is talking to the Sadducees. And the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the Sadducees were questioning Jesus about the resurrection. And in particular, they were using the example of marriage where this lady married eventually married seven brothers and all the brothers eventually died whose wife would she be in the resurrection and look at verse 29 of this chapter and Jesus answered them you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God you're wrong. Now, let's look at that phrase, you are wrong. That's a pretty powerful phrase there. It's kind of in your face. The phrase actually literally translates, you are led astray. That's what the translation of that, that phrase, you are wrong, it actually means you are led astray. There are so many teachers on TV, radio, and in pulpits, and going around teaching seminars that you and I have access to, not to mention the social media. And you can get all kinds of information, religious information, but does that information come directly from Scripture, or is it some opinion of some author or some teacher. 
What is your theology? Where do you get your understanding of God and life? Do you get it from music? Or do you get it from the word of God? And when you hear false teaching, do you recognize it? Could you pick it up? Well, no, I, I can't, but how do you do that? You memorize scripture. The pastor is responsible before God to teach you the word of God, the truth of the word of God, so you won't be led astray. And he has to study the scripture so he won't be led astray as well. I can be misled just as easily as any of you. But the main thing that keeps us from being led astray is the study of the scripture. Jesus gave the purpose of the church in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. He said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The word go there doesn't mean pack your bags and go to another country. It means as you go through life, as you live your life daily, and as God brings people into your life, you talk to them about Christ whenever that opportunity is given. And we make disciples. What is a disciple? It's the one who follows and commits their life to a teacher. And so who do you want to be a disciple of? It's Christ. Y'all don't follow me. Y'all follow Christ. So we point people to Christ. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then look at the other responsibility of the, of the church. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's the role of the pastor. Teaching the scripture. Giving, the, giving brothers and sisters in Christ the truth of the word so you'll know the truth. So when you're standing in the line at the, at the, the shopping center somewhere or some store and you got 50 people in line and the slowest cashier in the world and you're standing there in sin, what are you doing? You want to get that line going fast? Start talking about the Lord. <laughs> Be calm, be collected, and just strike up conversation. See how it goes. Making disciples, teaching the word. Jesus is the door. He is the only way to truth. He's the only way to salvation. And when you and I have that salvation, He's the only one to nurture that spiritual life. And he nurtures it by the word of truth, the Bible, which you have in your lap right now. He truly is the door. Are you walking through the correct door? Are you focused on Christ and in his word? That's the key. That's the key to it. Think about that this afternoon, before, during, and after your nap. Think about that. Are you being taught the scripture? And am I searching the scripture? Am I finding the pasture that my soul is longing for as a believer in Christ? Am I really searching the scripture so I'll know the truth? And the truth will set you free from any sin because it always points to Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's what we need to be doing. The correct door is the only door you and I need to be going through is Christ for salvation and sanctification. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd love to talk to you after this time of worship to show you the door, to show you Christ. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we love you and thank you for your love to us. Thank you that Jesus Christ 
is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. Thank you that he is the door to the sheep to bring people to himself, that they would be freed from the bondage of sin and death. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone in this room right now who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you'll bring them through that door as you lead them by your Holy Spirit. And then he is the door for the sheep where we have the freedom to come and to pray to you and to worship you and to study your word, to be taught the word through your servants and by your Holy Spirit to honor you in our lives and to have that peace of heart and mind which surpasses all understanding. Lord, you've spoken to our hearts from your word by your spirit. I pray that each one of us will respond in a way to you as you direct us this day. For this I ask in Jesus' name.